Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. It's episode uh, 114. We've done 114 of these things. I can't even believe it. Uh, it's December 10th, 2018. Welcome to Human Factors Cast. You're watching or listening. Welcome. We welcome you. Uh, I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm here with Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, hi. Hey, we're hanging out. We're talking human factor stuff. Uh, we got some We got some stories to talk about today. Those robot janitors are going to take your jobs. Uh, uh, probably. <laughs> Not just mopping uh, the floor. As if Walmart needed any more problems. Uh, we have uh, Google employees. They are uh, dropping Dragonfly. I like dragonflies. Do you but like not this one? You don't like this dragonfly. This one's kind of right. scary. What is it? We'll figure it out. Oh my god! Hey, did you know that 6.4 million children in the U.S. have ADHD, and this company wants doctors to treat them with video games? That sounds preposterous. I know. It's, it, we'll check it out. It's kind of cool. We'll find out. Yeah, yeah we'll we'll find out <laughs> after every every story. Hey, but first, uh, welcome new listeners. We tend to pick up a few of you after some of our uh, bonus coverage. We just did uh, HFESA coverage special thanks to mateo for coming on the show and and uh giving us all the good dirty deets from perth australia um he has some really great resources up in the slack so go check those out um let's see here what else are we talking about today blake man you and i don't have a lot of banter no, to go we about, don't but extended programming notes let's do it thank goodness <laughs> hey really quick we're on youtube and we're really close to that 100 subscriber mark we know how many of you listen to the show uh, and uh, it would mean a whole awful lot to us if you would just go to YouTube, search for Human Factors Cast, and hit a subscribe button. Smash that button. Could we make it easier for them? We probably could. Can we put like a link to the YouTube in the description? I think we do. So they can just subscribe to it? Pretty sure we do. In case that if it's we, not there. If we don't. You know what? I'm going to check right now because that's a smart thing. Hey, go to the uh, the description. We and, are uh, really close, guys. That would be awesome if we can get that name before somebody else takes it. Yeah, it would be super cool because uh, we know there's a couple of you out there that are uh, kind of sniping us on YouTube, and th- they want the uh, the YouTubes. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> go uh, yeah, go go do that. That would help us out. We need that slash name to help other people find the show because you know what? I'm going to go ahead and plug this. We are 100% listener supported, which means uh, we get all of our support from listeners like you. And uh, the only way that we spread uh, is through word of mouth. And so we need your help. If you hit that subscribe button, you can help other people find the show a lot easier. So uh, I really hate begging for this stuff, man. I, I'm looking forward to the week where I can just say, find us on YouTube at Human Factors Cast. It's almost there. We've got <laughs> like less than 40 more subs to get that name in there. Yeah. And then, we, then everybody can find us very easily. If every one of you went and go sub to us we'd have a lot of subs go do it uh okay so hey we are giving away an hfes membership (gasps) and uh, what yeah so hfes the organization that we did some a lot of coverage we partnered with last year to do a lot of coverage out of uh where was it it was in philadelphia wasn't that this year that was this year yes ah interesting yeah good i'm already starting to think ahead yeah he's already in 2019 2019 uh which Fun, fun fact, in a couple of weeks here, we'll be recapping our 28 predi- 2018 predictions. Uh, and uh, Which I think, once again, I didn't have too many come true. I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. talk about it. Uh, but, yeah, we're going to be recapping our 2018 predictions. We're going to be looking ahead to 2019. And we're going to do our annual tradition of looking at every single news story that happened this year and kind of, uh, kind of looking at them with fresh eyes. And seeing how they connect to each other. Which should be fun. It'll be I mean, great. There's been a lot of things that have happened in technology over the past, you know, 12 months. Yeah, you'd be surprised what things just happened this year that seemed like, you know, decades ago at Yeah, this I know. Point. A lot so, of the regulation stuff for autonomous vehicles is yeah, fun to I, talk about. I mean, it's always fun to kind of look at those in the context of today and see how we're doing. So, Nick, I don't know if you said it, but in case you didn't, when does the contest end for the HFES membership? Oh, hey, that's great. Yeah, it ends exactly in uh, six days. So it's on the 16th that this ends. So if you're listening, please go enter. It's in our description. It's all over the place. Uh, on our Slack, I think I posted it. On our Twitter uh, really easy to find. If you have trouble, just reach out to either one of us or the show. Uh, happy to help you uh, help you find where to enter that contest. Um, but yeah, it's it's really valuable. You get the HFES membership. Uh, that gives you access to things like 
the journal. You get a full year of the HFES journal. Uh, you get, um, hey, look at me. I am a bad host because I don't have my phone on airplane mode. <laughs> Hey, I'm usually pretty good about it. Uh, hey, but you so. do get a lot of great content from HFES, right? I mean, if especially now that they're revamping their website and kind of their content strategy, it's going to be targeted more at like what you're interested in technical group wise and all that kind of good stuff. So it's yeah. a, it's a good time to win a free membership and see what's going on. Yeah, you get you get those connections, you get discounted rates to go to HFES. So there's a lot of really good uh, really good benefits. We've partnered with HFES to give away that free membership. So go enter. Uh, and again, it ends in six days. So enter now uh, before it before it slips away. You get your 2019 Human Factors and Ergonomic Society annual membership. Epic. Yeah. Hey, uh, there's a couple of uh, um, conferences next year. There are, Nick. Is there something in particular you're looking forward to in 2019? Like, I know we, we kind of plug the same conferences every week, but I didn't we know do. if there was something else coming up that you were looking forward to that we haven't talked about on the show. Are you alluding to something specific? Because I don't... I'm not. Okay, no, no, I'm really not. I'm not. I don't have any kind of notes or ploys here. No, I mean, we usually say the same ones, right? Healthcare Symposium, IEEE, CHI, HFES. Um, particularly, I'm looking forward to CHI. I'm, I'm interested to see what comes out of CHI this year because... Me too. Woodrow had a blast, and it's going to be over in Glasgow in the UK this year. Um, I'm really so trying to swing that somehow or another. I don't know how I'm going to do it yet. Oh, yeah. Figure would, it out. I would love for you to go and cover it on the show. That'd be amazing. It'll be a blast. Uh, I'd be here sitting in the studio alone with you on Skype. No, you can bring uh, one of our other coworkers <laughs> who will not be named. Yeah, yeah. Uh, until he comes on the show. But honestly, Nick, I would love to go to IEEE because I, th- I feel like this year and probably year in years past, we've done like their – you know, weirdest things at IEEE conference stuff. And that always oh, yeah. seems like so much fun. You're absolutely right. Those like novel interfaces. Yeah. Yeah, those are cool. So I kind of want to look into that and see where it's at this year and like what it would take to actually go and check it out. Or if we've got any friends of the show who might be going and checking it out. Yeah, please let us know if you're going to any interesting conferences. However big or small it is, we want to hear from you because if you can come on the show and let everybody know kind of what the central themes or any findings from the show, it's always kind of nice to get that wide variety of conferences. Like we've been covering some pretty big ones on the show and um, you know, it's, it's always nice to kind of even like local ones. Like I think those are, those are valuable too. Like USPA Boston. Yeah. Like that was, that was pretty local. I don't know if that's like a, you know, well-known thing, but it was kind of cool to get that coverage because it's something that we, you and I, here based in San Diego, we wouldn't get. Sure, yeah. Uh, and especially worldwide, you know? Like, we have a worldwide audience. I, I, I think that's incredibly valuable, especially for some local things. You know, that's interesting, because I haven't thought about this, and maybe it's something we should, you and I should pull the thread on, but there's a, in San Diego alone, there's a design organization called Design Forward Alliance, and it kind of works with UX practitioners, human factors people, and people just involved in tech in San Diego. And they do a conference every year that's very small. It's like a two-day thing. Um, and also, I know UXPA in LA is putting on a bigger conference this in in 2019, so it might be worth kind of bringing the smaller events to the the bigger population. Yeah, let's 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 pull that thread. Fun time. I like it. Um, so you and I both don't have banter because nothing no. interesting ever happens in our lives. No, we just go to ugly sweater parties and that's yeah. it. Yeah. Well, and you and I went to an ugly sweater party. We did. Yeah. Yeah. Had a um, good time. Yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty good time. You got to see how chaotic it can be playing Jackbox TV <laughs> with 16 people. Yeah, that, I guess we could pull on that. That was a, that was a fun experience. Um, and perhaps the most intense social pressure, social peer oh, pressure goodness. that you had ever seen. Um, <laughs> yeah, is, I'm, I'm putting, I'm paraphrasing your words there. Yeah, that's true. That was, that was pretty <laughs> intense. So uh, let's just say a person at the party was... Um, being encouraged by other people at this party who are not Nick or I, who are not Blake or myself, uh, to take a shot. Uh, and to the point where this peer pressure was so intense that in this game called bracketeering, where basically a prompt comes up on the screen and everyone kind of enters their own response. And then it then puts it back to the audience where everyone kind of votes on the best option for this, uh, this prompt right so and then and then the winner moves on to the next round it's like the tournament style where you have four groups of four and then the winner of those goes on to battle another group of two and then uh, eventually you have a come up with a winner and it was so bad that one of these rounds almost every single entry was this person take the shot (laughs) or some permutation of that right which is just insane right name and shot and uh 
just take the shot. Like there's there's a lot of permutations, and so obviously take the shot one. Um, yeah, it was a, it was really intense. Uh, I just couldn't believe that because we've played this Jackbox TV stuff like for game nights and stuff like that before. But with 16 people, it was amazing that just through your phone and through like, what does it run through on the television? Is it from uh, Switch or Nintendo? Yeah, they were playing it from the Nintendo Switch, so just a game console or computer. Yeah, I mean to to really only have to just log in through a web browser and put a code in, and then you ha- can have 16 people playing this kind of simple but goofy game that where you're basically just you know, voting on what phrase phrase is the best over a bracket. Um, and just seeing so many people get into it and just having a good time is pretty funny with such really basic technology these days. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And it, uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again, but it's really interesting how it hijacks your primary distraction method and turns that into your primary interaction method so that way you can't be distracted while you're playing this game with other people. Yeah, I don't remember you saying that. That's very eloquently put. Because well, yeah. it is true. Like, yeah. you're, you're no longer allowed to kind of like i don't know i found myself even doing it when i felt like it was in awkward situations or standing by myself at a party i would kind of look at my phone Pull out and your phone and look just goof around for a second to, until i was like all right let's go try and interact with people but this way right. you couldn't escape you were all exactly. kind of stuck interacting together through your phone and your main focus is the tv screen so that way it's one unified experience until and it directs everybody's attention to their phones and then they put in their thing and their responses and then you're directed back at the tv um to the point where you know if you really leave you're the app on your phone or whatever or the website i guess you, you know coming back to it you the pace of the games are so quick that you get punished for leaving which i'm assuming i guess is intentional right yeah because that way you're not even able to really lose focus on the game or get out of it or any of that kind of stuff so that's pretty awesome design yeah all right i think we talked enough you want to talk about some news dude yes all right, this is the part of the show all about Human Factors news. This is where we talk about everything related to the field of Human Factors. This could be anything from robot janitors to uh, what else we got? Uh, Google employees to children with ADHD. As long as it relates to Human Factors psychology or design, it's fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week? Fair game indeed. So robots are coming to a Walmart incorporated near you, and it's actually not just a gimmick. So the world's largest retailer is rolling out 360 autonomous floor scrubbing robots in some of its stores in the U.S. by the end of January. And it said in a joint statement with Brian Corp, which makes the machines, that the autonomous janitors can clean floors on their own even when customers are around. I think that's Brain Corp. Brain Corp. You might be right. But according to the San Diego base, according to the San Diego base. You always find some way to mess it up. It's okay. I love to. <laughs> the robots, which look like a cross between miniature Zambonis and a motorized wheelchair, already scrub floors in airports of Seattle, San Diego, Boston, and Miami. I've never seen one here. No. But at that time, they're looking to deploy the robots for security patrol and deliveries inside big box stores as well. Now, that's a multi-purpose tool right there. I mean, just one robot to kind of do all things. Yeah, one robot clean, to rule them all. Yeah, basically clean, secure the premises, and deliver things to you. Robot janitors. I, okay, so this is cool. I guess I don't, I don't, I don't know where to go with this conversation because, on one hand, this will, well, this will replace human jobs um, for janitorial duties uh, for potentially you know runners security as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I don't know how I feel about that. Obviously, new jobs will be created for this robot like there has to be some sort of maintainer uh that maintains the robot or you know whether obviously it'll be less jobs than the um yeah and do you start outsourcing jobs in that case right you don't really have to have somebody in-house doing that it could be a company that takes care of that kind of maintenance type stuff yeah and and uh so i don't know I, i i like this this uh trend of sort of introducing these robot um I don't know. They're like taskers. These robot, uh, autonomous robots that will perform mundane tasks. Like my ideal robot will do the dishes for me. Um, and I can't wait for that day. I'm sure it's coming soon. It can't be too far away. No, they already have like a like one of those arms that comes down and basically suction cups the thing in the middle and then does this like wiper around the outside. It's it's kind of cool. That's awesome. I d- I've never seen that before. I don't want to be out of a dishes doing job though. It's one of the few things I enjoy out of home chores. Uh, hang on, I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see if I can find this. Uh, it's like a handheld dishwasher. 
Uh, I'm just, I think I'm more interested to see how this starts to play out with people in the store. Because, I mean, at, at first, there's going to probably be a ramp up of people not really knowing how to feel about the robot being in the store, especially if it may be doing, like, security things or stuff like that. So it's like, the, oh, my goodness, that's insane. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Sorry. That looks uh, like a dragon grabbing your dishes. Yeah, it's kind of cool. It's, uh, anyway. Um, so God, would you call that a robot, or what, is that more of just a tool? I don't know. I mean, yeah, I guess it is a tool, but it's doing a lot of the process for anyway. We're, we're I really encourage people to look at this because I don't know. It's pretty insane looking. It looks like a I don't know the predator is doing your dishes. We are looking at a uh, automated dishwasher handheld tool that anyway. I'll, I'll put it in the the uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll put it in the video. <laughs> we'll watch it. But anyway, yeah. So back to this Walmart thing. Sorry to go on a tangent. We're, we, we're already off the rails and we need like a choo-choo sounder so to <laughs> get back on the rails. Yep. Um, in fact, while we're off the rails, I'm just going to bring up... Oh, here it comes. I thought of... You know what? Here's my banter for the week. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Let's play the song again. Uh, uh, no. Uh, for, <laughs> for the banter, I... Like, okay. So I thought about... We go off the rails a lot and we, we, say, we say a lot of things on the show. Um, it is an hour of talking. It is an hour of talking, and we say a lot of the same things every week. Yeah, that uh, you know are not necessarily related to the stories. It's just like Nickisms or Blakeisms. And I thought, what if we put together a bingo card and like randomized them for our listeners, so that way they can play Human Factors Cast Bingo as they're listening. That would be they can awful. be like, oh, they said off the rails. That's that's a free. Ten points. That's the free space. Oh my god. Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, like, so I I don't know. There I are those, a lot of those. I'm sure. Okay, anyway, back to the Walmart story. What were we saying? Autonomous things taking jobs and performing tasks that humans don't want to do. Yeah, and so that's a funny dichotomy, right? Is It is kind of scary to see that we're losing jobs to robots, but are they jobs people really actually want to do? And can Walmart find other jobs for the people that they already have right. to still do in the store? I really don't know because I don't know what it takes to run Walmart. Yeah. Um, but you, you make it a good point. There could be a maintainer job. Uh, and I think for at least the immediate moment, there's probably going to be a lot, p- probably a large learning curve for how to interact with robots, whether you're a employee yourself or if you're a customer in the store, what if things malfunction while people are in the store? There's just a lot of kind of, you know, things Walmart probably has thought through. And also, I mean, these have been deployed, like they said, kind of in airports as well. And the thing about the airports that I'm wondering is if these are running like at just odd times at night only, not so much that it's out and available for people to have to worry about running into or them running into other people. Yeah, so the article does say that it is, um, at first it will be required for a human to kind of, uh, to basically control this thing so that way it learns the layout of the store. And uh, at least, you know, doing a quick search of Brain OS, it looks like, Exactly like what they were saying. It's like the Zamboni with a with a you know uh, like a like a wheelchair Zamboni. Um, Isn't that a strange design? Because it's ultimately not going to have anybody riding it, but it's it's basically built like a Zamboni to drive it around. Yeah, I I don't know, man. Like the training requires a human, right? So the training has to sit in the device this this wheelchair this Zamboni and basically ride it around the store to train it the layout. But there are other robotic systems that will automatically learn the layout of a room or a place like Roomba does this, although that's probably proprietary. Um, But I'm assuming, I mean, it couldn't couldn't have been out of their reach to figure that out. I wonder if it's because, like, store layouts change so often, so maybe it just would, but it's still, you would think that it would be able to pick up and learn over time. Yeah, I don't know. But, I don't. Yeah. I don't know what the deal is. But but what this tells me is that there will be some sort of human input it, it, at various posi- uh, you know various points of this life cycle of this product, which is good. I mean, ultimately, hopefully, that doesn't lose as many jobs as may be projected. Um, but I don't know. Only time will kind of tell. I want to see one of these, you know, doing security patrol. Although I'm I'm assuming that maybe that there's some kind of updates to the design or maybe some of the functionality to it if it's doing different jobs because right now it's kind of focused on the cleaning aspect of it yeah yeah i don't know um where does this go from here where where do you see this kind of technology going next honestly i i I don't know i really am not sure what the future of robots like this are I, i think this is a good test case for these kind of bigger box stores and in airports where you have a lot of high volume of traffic because then it's potentially going to have a lot of pot- a lot of potential for it to have to interact with lots of different people and learn the layouts and stuff like that. So seeing how 
how well the robot can run without even human interaction or what happens if, you know, there's a minor change in the store type of stuff. Yeah, I I just don't know where to go from here. I It's cool. It's going to be nuts. <laughs> uh, all right, what's up next? All right, so Google employees are actually joining with Amnesty International and calling on Google to cancel Project Dragonfly, so Google's effort to create a censored search engine for Chinese market that enables state surveillance. International human group, human rights organizations and investigative reporters have also sounded the alarm, emphasizing serious human rights concerns and repeatedly calling on Google to cancel the project. Reportedly, from an p- employee perspective, the aversion to the project is not about China itself, but it, its employees object to technologies that aid the powerful in oppressing the vulnerable, wherever it may be. So the Chinese government certainly isn't alone in readiness to stifle freedom of expression and to use surveillance to repress dissent. But Dragonfly in China would establish kind of a dangerous precedent at a vol- at a kind of volatile political moment, one that could make it harder for Google to deny any other country's similar concessions. So Google's decisions comes as a Chinese government is openly expanding its surveillance powers and tools of population control, and many rely on these advanced technologies and combined online activity, personal records, and mass monitoring to track the profile of its citizens. So providing any government with access to this kind of data would make Google complicit in oppression of human rights abuses. So that's a whole lot going on there. But basically, they're going to make a Google search engine that allows you to get kind of surveil people a little more a little more intensely than what's done in China now or potentially in mm. other countries. So it's okay for Google to have the data, but not for the government. Yeah, and I think that's kind of an interesting point. I mean, how much how much data does Google have on American citizens, but we're able to see and interact with a lot more of the internet? We don't have like a restricted internet right. per se. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a that's a restriction in China, right? There's a lot of websites that you're not able to get to yeah content you can't post and stuff you just can't interact with and uh, you know i don't know from a business perspective i wonder if this is like even that great of a move for google because i mean they're just gonna give up some of their proprietary information to a, a different government i mean potentially that they won't be useful in a few years for them yeah but think about how big the market is in china oh it's huge a- yeah. advertisements and sure all that stuff like if if they don't do this, they're missing out on that revenue. And, uh, well, I mean, you know, it's a business at the end of the day. So I understand why they would, why the company, Google the company, would push for something like this. But the employees are saying, no, I don't want to be a part of this because this violates human rights in some, you know, aspect. Because you're giving a government that could be used, you know, you're giving government data that could be used against its citizens. And, I mean, it, I think the, the real point here the bottom of the article is that if you do this once you're probably going to do it multiple times right like you're not going to how are you going to be able to say like no to specific other governments versus yes to china or yes to anybody else uh so it it, it does bring up a pretty tough precedent in terms of i mean are you are you really violating human rights does it do they already have kind of these problem or these kind of laws and precedents in place where you can't view such information and is it going to be used nefariously there's no way to really tell you can only make assumptions at this point why take the chance man there's a lot of names on this thing like i don't know if you saw this there's a lot yeah there is a and i think that list keeps growing to be honest well yeah they're updating this article as names are signed on so yeah, there's, yeah, which there's, is, a, there's lot a lot of pushback from people within Google itself. So I think that's saying something. If they like are already kind of hesitant from an engineering perspective all the way to like design and all that stuff, I mean, that's that's definitely important. But I mean, do you think that Google stepping in and doing this project in a different country really is a good idea? Is it a bad idea? Does it bring up ethical questions? What do you think? Uh, I think all of the above. Um, it does bring up ethical questions, like how far should or or to whom do we give our data does to whom does our data belong to and um you know what what do they do with that data and there's a lot of conversation right now about what goes on with our data is it truly an extension of ourself is our fitness data is our search history data our browser history data is that all our stuff or does that like belong in the net that's then aggregated and used for advertisement purposes. I, I don't know. It's, it's it's a weird weird question because I have I don't know if you have this app, but I have like uh, Google Opinion Rewards, and they basically give me money for taking surveys that inform them about my profile. So, 
they are tapping into my GPS data and they can tell when I've gone to a certain store and they're like, hey, which of these places have you gone to recently? And you click the places you've gone to recently and they're like, hey, when was the last time you visited this place? It's like, oh, that was yesterday. Did you go in? Did you buy anything? Oh, yeah, I bought stuff with my credit card. Um, hey, do you have that receipt? Can you can you just take a picture and then send that to us? Oh, wow, that's a lot of information. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, here you go. All right, here's 50 cents. Thanks. But that adds up because I get it every day. So right now, I, I'm pretty sure I've earned over $100 in, like, Google Play credit for just answering a couple quick questions every now and then. And I know they're building a profile about people my age um, that are male that are that go to these types of places, like how to better inform their advertisements, right? Like, sure. Hey, I'm going to advertise a burrito because you go to this Mexican place like five times a week. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, so like, uh, well, but they're rewarding me for that. Yeah, I mean, even, well, think about that. If, if they're collecting that much information, because that sounds like a lot that you're giving them, so they should be paying you for it. Yeah. And especially if it's ultimately, you know, they're going to pay you once, but use the kind of information for a multiple multiple purposes to target ads and sure. all that kind of stuff, build but profiles. But at the same time, I mean, think about what they're always collecting that we don't that get That you for. don't get paid for. Yeah, that's what I'm saying is like, yeah. should that be, should you have access to that, right? And I know there's been a couple pushes over the last year, and maybe we can look at those when we do our recap episodes um, of the theme of privacy, because that was a big theme this year, uh, just overall. Yeah, and I, th- I think that's that's where really the problem comes in, right? Because we're we talk we've talked a lot over the year about the access to your own data and being you know made aware, of course, of all this kind of Facebook stuff that's gone over gone on over the past year. I mean, are we really in control of what they're collecting, or do we even have a, a semblance of an idea? And now kind of imagine in this, you know, Google setting in China where it may be worse than that. It's like you could be having data used against you. Like if you, I don't know, if using your location data and tying you to some sort of crime that maybe you didn't commit. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of, I guess, implications that here we're trying to think through and get an understanding of, oh, should we really, should we really have access to all of our data? And if we do... What does it mean if companies are able to, you know, harvest it and use it the way they want to? Do they have to inform us? Do they only have to inform us sometimes? I mean, it's a it's a huge problem even in the states. So I can't imagine it being something that's basically surveillance and hidden from from under you, and you don't necessarily know. Like every time I use the internet, even if it's limited, what's being collected and how it's going to be used later on. Yeah, just a really quick. I want to kind of follow up on the number of people that have signed us as of recording. Uh, what is it? Five o'clock Monday night. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there have been 735 signatures. The first one, by the way, is a UX designer. So that's that's something. Ultimate. Uh, so and you know, just doing a quick Google search, there's about uh, 85,000 employees at Google. So you have almost an entire percent of the workforce saying, "No, I don't want to work on this." And that's you know, the 85,000 includes everyone, not just software developers, but janitors managers you know so this is this is a i don't know i feel i feel like this is a significant number of employees that's a lot of people yeah i mean especially for you know and it tells you who they are what their role is and just kind of sampling some of these things you have like technical program managers software engineers ux researchers ux designers um site reliability engineers there's a lot of diversity in uh you know who's reporting these right I haven't seen any oh, tools and infrastructure. There's a, there's one, um, I don't know, staff. Where did I just see staff? Staff UXR anthropologist. That's amazing. I don't know. What That's do. really cool. So there's a lot of different people with different uh, backgrounds that are saying, no, I don't want to work on this. I don't want to be a part of this. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty cool to see this this type of movement where, employees of a company kind of dictate where the company goes with policy. We'll see whether or not they listen. And I don't think this is the first time Google employees have done this either. No. Because this was this happened a couple months ago, right? They definitely spoke up with a defense contract that was uh uh I think it was like how close to the trigger do you get because it was like I don't I, I don't know. I feel like it was very controversial and I don't know. Do At the quick. time it definitely was. Um, and I wonder if the numbers kind of compare, but I know that they that the employ. Which interesting about Google is in that case, I'm pretty sure the employees did drive the decision they made, which was yeah. to get away from Google. That particular Google contract. end up Google end up dropping that bid, um, and it was uh, for basically using cloud and AI technologies in warfare. That's what yeah. it was. So 
Yeah, I, I, um, employees, if they speak up enough, can dictate where the company goes. And that's kind of cool that they are empowered enough to do that and that companies are listening, right? I have no idea how many signatures were on that Google Defense uh, contract. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, regularly scheduled program. Yep. All right. Anyway, uh, any other thoughts on this one, Blake, here? No, I just I thought it would be interesting to talk about some of the strange implications that come up because I, th- I feel like a theme throughout the past year has been data privacy. And so thinking about it from a different perspective of like a surveillance um, kind of lens instead of what we're used to, which is like, well, maybe we can get a hold of the data we have and be in control of it, but imagining that it, you're on the flip side. Yeah, I'm really excited to dig into the whole stories of the year. These included. We'll, we'll go all the way up to the very end. So, uh, except for next week, I think. I think I don't think. Well, we might do. Ne- yeah, we'll do next week's stories too. Yeah, why not? Yeah, we'll we'll do them anyway. Uh, well, if you don't have anything else to say, I want to get into this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is Human Factors Etc., we're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. It depends. Hey, uh, before we move on, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Inc., Medium, and Bloomberg for all of our stories this week. If you want to follow along, we do post all the links to the original articles across social media as well as our Slack, so go check those out. Uh, also in Slack... I just want to mention that we have other active members of our community that are frequently posting uh, news stories that we don't talk about on the show. And and sometimes we talk about them on Infinite. So, um, yeah, Mateo. It's a nice little tie. Thanks, Mateo. <laughs> Mateo's just killing it in Slack. He's, he's doing great. Uh, but honestly, there's there's a lot of really good stuff in there. Um, so go check that out. All right, Blake. Got one more news story. What's up? One more. All right. So Killy Interactive has created the medical equivalent of nutritious snack cakes. So what does that mean? The company based in Boston and San Francisco develops video games that deliver sensory and motor stimuli engineered to treat conditions like ADHD, autism, depression, and even MS. When Achilles' first product comes to market following FDA approval, possibly by next year, doctors will be able to prescribe it just like medicine. The companies comply with principles laid out by the Digital Therapeutics Alliance and Industry Association for this kind of material. And the pediatric market is appealing because of its size. I mean, ADHD alone has diagnosed 6.4 million children in the U.S. And because of parents' concerns about children taking drugs, this could be a viable alternative. Other digital therapeutic companies target everything from diabetes to Alzheimer's to chronic back pain and other sleep disorders. Trials from Achille have shown that improvements in cognition, symptoms, and daily functioning can occur. And some domains, like Achilles' digital approach, was in the range of what drugs can achieve. In others, the product was somewhat less effective, but it remains far safer than some pharmaceuticals. So, Nick, this is a pretty crazy story to me in that we're using kind of a digital therapy in place of drugs that can maybe combat such such diverse problems like ADHD all the way to depression and maybe even MS. Back in my day, people used to think video games rotted your brain. They did, and they still do. Yeah, so look, like this uh, this, this company, Achille, they're basically, their slogan, the, the first thing you see when you go to their website is, time to play your medicine, which is kind of a cool concept, right? If you think about how this could help individuals with ADHD, depression, anxiety, anything like that, um, like, I know anecdotally, this works. Um, there have been a lot of times when I or people I know uh, are extremely anxious or depressed or something and they play a video game and it I don't know if it cures them but it certainly distracts them from you know that feeling in the moment sure and it could be like sort of uh, an immediate intervention to prevent them from spiraling um, so I, I'm curious to see in what you know in what ways these 
games are custom built to treat uh, these conditions. Yeah, so you threw an example in here. Do you want to kind of walk through it and s- kind of talk about some of the potential games that they're throwing out there? Sure, yeah. So this example here, so um, Akili has run several clinical trials on its software. So this this racing game called Project Evo that plays on smartphones and tablets. Patients maneuver their avatars down a fast-moving river. As obstacles pop up, they must quickly choose whether to tap, catch, or avoid them. It's tailored in a personalized fashion to push the bounds of the frontal processing system of the brain dealing with complex information. Okay, so it's basically, <laughs> yeah, uh, that to me just says they're using it for, like, critical thinking skills. And yeah, like super focused attention is what it sounds like in some instances. Yeah. Like really and taxing your frontal lobe or whatever. I guess I, I don't want to, like, I, I don't want to knock this because I want to see, like, what is uh, the sort of tailor custom built um, aspect of this video game that potentially like will lead to reduced ADHD or, you know, like what part of this game treats the symptoms? That's what I want to know. Yeah. Cause I'll, the only thing I could take from an example like that is if it's, it's forcing you to make like focus very attentively and make quick decisions. So maybe in the game you're able to, you know, flex that attention a little bit more. Okay. But what's, how does that really translate outside of the game? And what's into different real life really quick. What's different from that or something like Fortnite? You're still, you have to make really quick decisions. It's just a different, you know, methodology. There's, yeah, I, I think the only argument maybe there is there can be a lot of stalling in something like Fortnite where there's not particularly a lot of action and you can have times of lag and stuff like that where this sounds like something you almost just do on demand that's super targeted and has like a very... Because, you know, in Fortnite it almost has that there's a lot of different things that can happen depending on other players and situations and stuff like that. This sounds like it's much more focused and targeted. That's, but that's fair. That's an assumption. That's fair. I just... I I struggle to find, like... And and maybe it would be different if I actually got to play it and sit down with it. But, like, I am just struggling to see what's different from this than potentially other video games out there. Because, you know, there are video games that exist that probably, you know, treat this very same or, or meet this very same sort of a, a need, right? Like, I, I'm looking for video on this and I can't find any video of Project Evo. So, sorry, YouTube viewers. <laughs> but, I mean, like, maybe we'll find something. But I... I I just want to see some gameplay to see, like, how exactly this works. Yeah, and I'm kind of surprised that this is, like, being treated as kind of, like, an alternative to medicine. And, again, I'd like to see kind of, like, what papers come out from this stuff and how the FDA approves it. Because it, it says that's kind of, like, pending at the moment. Uh, because yeah. I would almost expect the opposite, right? From Especially if people, are, like, have ADHD or that... Or what I've kind of observed, I guess, in children is, like, they, they kind of get more absorbed in, like, playing games versus interacting with other people and social situations and how this could be really, like, getting away from, you know, ADHD specifically. I'm not sure. But obviously, I mean, they wouldn't be making claims without some sort of mechanism that they're trying to rely on to change the outcomes of the either how people interact with others or if it's just used as, like, a therapy to calm people down. I'm not really completely sure. So I will say... They do mention monitoring in their model. So you have this treatment and monitoring uh, sort of loop where potentially the system or, you know, uh, licensed professionals are are seeing how the individuals are reacting to this treatment. And that could potentially feed back into the game. So I will give them, you know, they, they potentially have that feedback loop going on where it's customized and tailored to what they need. Um, Which is great, especially if on the opposite end, like we've talked about for, you know, other products is a doctor or somebody sure. else who's like treating you psychiatrically or whatever it may be. Like we've talked about that with, you know, some of the Fitbit style data if that gets fed back to your doctor and they can make, you know, more accurate or more informed decisions about like treatments for you or stuff like stuff like diet. And if this is the if this is a similar thing, that would be cool to see and see how it like interacts with people over time. I think the biggest thing to think about here and this is kind of a a typical psychology answer is it's going to be left up to so much individual difference that i wonder you mean what they're gonna see yeah basically (laughs) what they're gonna see over over like a larger population of people like let's say that 6.4 million children in the u.s who have adhd well how many does this really 
produce any sort of effect at all. Yeah, I will say um, it's kind of cool to see their uh, display of where they're at in the process of these things. I mentioned this with the ISO standards last week. They had a really unique display of where it is in the process. And Akili kind of has this uh, similar uh, format where they have, you know, they're in a feasibility test or they're a pilot test or a pivotal study uh, to kind of, you know, address where it is in treating these different, um, you know, disorders. So you have like ADHD is in its pivotal study, autism spectrum disorders in its pilot study, uh, major depressive dis- disorders in its pilot study, um, MS is in its feasibility study. So it's, it's interesting to see that, you know, they're they're looking at this across a, a wide variety of, of uh, different disorders. Yeah, I like that they're actually showing the approach they're taking, right? That, that, that yeah. it's not just like, oh, we found a digital solution that we think is going to be one size fit all. I mean, at least from the graphical standpoint, they're showing that they're trying to even assess feasibility of something treating a disorder and then piloting and going from there. So that's that's pretty promising. I mean, who knows what it will really bring over the next few years. Um, but it looks like they've been doing a lot of work, especially with HDA, ADHD from like 2013, publishing their first paper about it in Nature to like all the way up till last year. Yeah, I, I think this is kind of cool, though. Like if you think about this from the perspective of going forward, you might not be prescribing drugs that are mood altering or um, potentially damaging to youth that are still developing. Right. You're not introducing those drugs that could, you know, however, however you see that good, positive or negative, I think. Um, this is an interesting approach that's that's more sort of holistic in nature that that's you know not looking at that um chemical piece but it's it's more looking at the behavioral aspects which i i think is really interesting i think um, it's taking advantage of the fact that it evolution is probably not the right word but the way that we're growing as like humans we interact with technology so much yeah why it only kind of makes sense to try and use that to treat some of the ailments we have, if possible, especially like you're making, like you're making a great point when you introduce some of these, like some of these drugs like Ritalin and stimulants at a very young age. I mean, it, it can have a lot of impact later in life. when We don't necessarily right. know what that is. So something like this that could potentially, you know, skirt that or help, you know, at least help some of the symptoms of something like ADHD or even like early onset depression is it's awesome and worth testing at least. Yeah, super cool. Um, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one? I don't. I really want to read this paper on depression, though, because it sounds like it's a, it's an interesting randomized trial of the proof of concept here. Yeah, uh, I, I am definitely going to be reading up more on this guy here anyway. Uh, hey, you know what time of the show it is? What time? It came from... It came from... It came from Reddit. And that's that part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community's talking about. Any subreddit's fair game as long as it relates to the topic of human factors, psychology, or design. Uh, and it has to encourage discussion among the community. Uh, or, you know, we have to, it has to go through us. Let's just say that. That's, yeah, there you that's go. Right, that's what it comes down to. All right. Our first one uh, tonight comes from the user experience subreddit from user uh, Xenaxia, I think. I'm going to go with Xenaxia on that one. I think so. All right. This one says... Oh, we've got two uh, from Xenaxia. Oh, hey. Wow. Xenaxia is just super active over there. Um, Xenaxia goes on to write, how to make my company understand the valuable value of usability testing. Really? This question again. All right. Oh, oh you can do a different one. There are four of them. No. Oh, there's four of them. All right. Let's see here. Uh, what do you want to do? we got time for a couple. Um, now, nah, let's do this one. We'll, we'll do it again. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can talk about how user interviews through a digital medium are different. Is that one? Yeah. Where's that one? Oh, hey, look at that. By her again. Yeah. Or him or her. Not really sure. User Xenaxia. User experience subreddit. Let's do this one. How valid are user interviews through a digital medium? All right. I like this one better. This one's interesting. All right. So I've been trying to research pianist that started as a child. One easy way to do it is through forums. I can, for example, chat with several pianos at once. I'm assuming pianists. Uh, I don't even have to write a transcript. But how valid is this compared to a face-to-face interview? That's a good question. Blake, I'm going to throw this one over to you first to see what your 
your thoughts on this question are? This is kind of excellent. This is not where I thought it was going to go because I know there's a lot of – I've dealt with this with a couple of my students, like doing – you know, in-person interviews versus through like a service like something like usabilitytesting.com. And this is kind of a little different take because it's through a forum. I I think something like this, I mean, you are you kind of run the chance of you don't really know who you're talking to. But at the same time, you're going to have that sort of bias when you talk to somebody in person too. You don't really know how honest the answers are. You can just hope they give you very valid information. And if you're just asking and trying to get more information in this case i guess researching how people got started playing piano young at an early age or maybe how it impacted them later on asking people through forums is not a horrible idea especially if you don't have access to the population you're testing or you don't even have like tangentially people you could ask that might be you know fit your criteria i i don't know what it would do in terms of like degrading information here because if you're just asking questions and you're asking kind of the same questions over and over to various participants, you should get like some sort of, you know, trend information based off the questions you're asking. It's the same thing as you would get face to face. One thing you're not going to be able to get unless you're doing, because this specifically talks about like forums. I'm assuming just a chat format, but one thing you won't be able to pick up on is visual cues. So looking at somebody in the face, when you ask them a question, sometimes you can ask, you know, extra questions or maybe follow up if they, you know, make a kind of, confused face or, or clarify the question a little bit easier um so i think there's pros and cons to both definitely i per- personally i'd rather do some sort of face-to-face interview where you can just look at somebody and kind of get a little bit more information if they like react a certain way to a question but i think a forum is a it's a brilliant way to kind of go at it if that's all you have access to yeah i would uh echo that I feel like any information that you can get is valuable. So whether or not that's through a face-to-face interview, whether that's through a forum, I think that's great. Um, I think one interesting approach is, or or one interesting way to sort of look at this is through passive versus active mediums. So I know, uh, I'm going to generalize this for a second here and not just say pianist for the sake of, of this advice here, but like if you think about like, these very dedicated products, right? A lot of them have a subreddit or some sort of user forum that they can go to. Now, what you can do as a UX designer, researcher, UX researcher, human factors practitioner, whatever, you can go to these forums and passively take in like all this feedback and say, look, a lot of people have hopped on this idea and they say they would love this quality of life improvement in my product or, um, you know, I hate this new thing that you just rolled out for X, Y, and Z reasons. And oftentimes there's a lot of noise. So the signal to noise ratio is pretty high with, you know, complaints. But, uh, you know, if you, if you find the right uh, threads, you can definitely kind of dig down deeper. And if you're super savvy, you can then switch that into a passive or or sorry, an active um, research role where you jump into that thread and say, Hey, look, um, I'm actually, a user experience designer for this company and I want to sort of get more of your feedback. Is it okay if I reach out to you through PM or something? And then, and then you can ask some follow-up questions. The, one of the tricks to this online approach is that um, if you are doing it through text, text-based, you're right, Blake, you can't see faces, but also I think it's important to note that the person that you're asking has time to, sit down and think about their answer and type it up before they hit enter where if you're in an interview sometimes sometimes there's pressure there's like social pressure to respond in a timely manner um you know unless you're good if you're a good interviewer you'll say please take your time like i'm not in any rush don't give any body language to indicate that you're in a hurry or that you're you know you're wanting their feedback asap like let them think about it but it's a lot easier to get that well thought through feedback in a digital medium if they're on board for it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of whatever you have access to might be your best medium. I, I don't know. This is making me kind of want to try something through forums to interact with people because, I mean, a lot of people are have been, you know, habituated to using them, and so maybe it's something that it's worth trying, especially if you're like trying to get your first UX job or if it's some kind of topic you're really interested in. Let me say I, I'm only speaking um, – I'm speaking about this through personal experience too. So let me just say I worked for a, um, a company that made electrical relays and we were 
uh, I was looking for sort of a, a persona, and I I pulled a lot of my data from the electrical engineering subreddit where this guy kind of went through his day to day. Someone had a question about what's your day to day look like. And this guy answered with a very detailed account of what his day-to-day looks like as an electrical engineer. Oh, there you go. And so I used a lot of that information to fill out a persona. I never reached out to him, but because I don't know if they used our products or what, but it was a good kind of like uh, template for you know what they go through in their day-to-day, and I used it for a persona. So I thought that was a kind of interesting way to go about collecting data for personas, uh, and it actually got a lot of positive reception. So... You know, it, it depends on how you use these internet uh, tools and and uh, methods, but I think it's entirely legitimate and um, can provide some value. I feel like market research in general can just be you can collect so much inter- information just from the internet alone, or from places like Reddit that have, you know, actual communities that are kind of detailing what actually is going on in either their day to day or products they use or anything like that. So I feel like there's a lot of resources for anybody in the human factors or UX or even ergonomic sectors that you can kind of get a better sense of who you're trying to target just by, you know, messing around on the internet and reading through forums and interacting with people. Okay, Blake, uh, unless you have any other thoughts on that one, I want to tackle this, this, uh, number two, do it. So this one is by the user Foxic 95 from the user experience subreddit. Um, And uh, they go on to write, how do you store user research data in a GDPR compliant way? Whoa, that's an interesting one. So background, I work as a UX junior in a government agency and am currently conducting user research interviews with my service design colleagues. While transcribing interview data, we wanted to share the data easily between us, so our minds went to Google Docs. But in doing so, we'd be unlawfully sharing user information with another company. So we'd have to censor everything to make it unclear who the people we interviewed are. In doing so, we started losing track of who we'd interviewed and what their connection is to the project, which made it harder to go back and interpret the data collected. How do you compile and share user research data together with colleagues without storing and sharing sensitive data while simultaneously making sure not to lose track of whom you've interviewed and their connection to the project? Let me know if this makes no sense, and I'll try to make it more clear. Try to make it more clear. Uh, this is I think this is a typical problem that a lot of people in the research realm expe- I mean, especially it's something like I think they mentioned what do they mention a government agency yeah that, yeah there's a lot of sensitivities that go on there with even just collecting data much less trying to figure out how to store it and share it with each other um, I know a one answer might be and again this is this is still not the greatest but if you're working working within a company typically you have your own within Com- with in-house internet, so like intranet, so saving stuff and sharing documents between small teams may be an option, but it, it's definitely good that you steer it away from something like Google Docs. Um, I know one way that I did it in college was basically giving a numbering scheme mm-hmm. to participants so that you could you could have some kind of identifying way or way to identify them later on if you needed to, but again, it was kept in encrypted files away from the actual research right. uh, file alone. So it's kind of tough. I would assume on something like this, and I don't think it can be this simple, but, I mean, can you ab- – abstracting who the person you interviewed was in terms of, like, maybe it's just their job or maybe that's exactly what's kind of classified or shouldn't be out there in the world versus, like, tying a name to it. So I'm kind of not sure if that's the issue, if it's naming or if it's the type of job or person they interviewed because they said they were, like, losing track quickly of who it was they interviewed. So this is a tough question. I mean, Nick, what do you got? Yeah, I, here in the States, in the DOD, we have uh, NISPOM compliance, um, which is, uh, you know, kind, kind of the same thing. We're, we're looking at um, protecting data. And so one method you could try, I don't know if this would be GDPR, um, but uh, one method that you can try is sort of this... Um, Print out your demographic sheet and uh, keep that separate from all other research, right? So, and on that demographic sheet, it's a printed out copy, but then assign numbers to it on a physical version. Write them in physically. The only tie is that physical piece. You're not storing that digitally. No one can tie that back. But if you're in a shared area, everyone should have access to that paper, put it up on the wall. Everyone can see who's, what number who is. And that way, When you go to tie all the information together, you can then look at uh, whatever it is that you're coding up 
and go back and see what uh, somebody else wrote about that person because it's all tied to a number. But again, that number is physically written on the paper. There's no digital ties to that number. That might be one way to get around it. Yeah, that sounds like a viable option. It, it's kind of funny just ser- just searching in Google, like, what do you do in this case, specifically related to GDPR, of like sharing sensitive data. It seems like there's a lot of questions about it that come out, like, in even in, like, Guardian articles and stuff like that, of how do you even share information across people. Uh, this might not even be only limited to, like, research data and kind of interactions that way. So it seems like it's a common problem that maybe – Maybe the people that have are building the standards for the GDPR need to help kind of solve some of the issues. In, in one way, I'm kind of surprised there's no product out there that exists that starts to help with this problem. Because I feel like there's so many agencies, like the DOD or any kind of government institution, and even some of the some of the bigger research institutions like NIH that like have to have ways of kind of randomizing and anonymizing the data, but still would need maybe some some of the precursors of knowing who that data is linked to. And in, in this case, if it's linked to a specific job type or the per some person they've interviewed that they need to remember that kind of stuff. So it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah. One we we may never know the answer to, or someone comes up with a software solution that saves us all. Yeah. I feel like it's a great, great way to go. Wouldn't that be wonderful? All right. Well, well, that's too loud. We're signing off for today. Uh, remember, everybody, we have that contest going on. Please go enter that for uh, a chance to win a one year. One whole year. One whole year of Human Factors and Ergonomics Society membership. Uh, let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. If you're a Patreon supporter, we're not having any after shows for the remainder of the year. Uh, just because we're kind of winding down, we know there's a backlog of episodes for you to listen to. So much content. <laughs> for the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us on any of our social media channels at 8 Tractors Podcast. Uh, if you like what you hear and want to support the show, uh, consider leaving us a review or, you know, you can always become a Patreon supporter too. Or you could even subscribe to us on YouTube. Hey, check that out. Any, anyway, supports us because, you know, word of mouth is key. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for hanging out with me on a Monday night, talking about stuff. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about robot janitors? Oh, goodness, guys. You can find me at Don't Panic UX on LinkedIn. Excellent. Special thanks to Mr. Jeff Olson for our video th- editing this week and every week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. And until next time, it, it depends. depends. I got nothing. You got something? Nope.